Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's overview of the 2025 proposed rule for the Quality Payment Program webinar. During today's session, subject matter experts from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, will provide an overview and future direction of the Quality Payment Program, explain 2025 proposed policy changes for traditional MIPS, MIPS Value Pathways, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and Advanced APMs, and highlight key differences between the 2024 performance year requirements and requirements proposed for the 2025 performance year. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session, and attendees will have an opportunity to ask questions via the Q&A box or via the webinar audio. A recording of this webinar and accompanying slides will be posted on the Quality Payment Program webinar library in the coming weeks. With that said, I'll now turn it over to Katie Moore at CMS to get us started. Katie? Great, thanks, Hallie. And good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to any folks that are brand new to QBP or are just trying to learn more about the program. And uh, welcome back to folks that have been with us for uh, several years now. Um, so just really appreciate you all taking the time uh, to join us. We know that a lot of you are clinicians and are taking time away from um, um, your work to, to hear about this program. Uh, so really appreciate all that uh, you all do to support your patients. Next slide. One more. Okay, great. Um, so the first few slides that we're going to cover today are really just uh, background for folks that are newer to the program. Just we always like to start with the same first couple slides in, in a lot of our materials and when we um, present on the program, just to level set in case we have any uh, new folks uh, to the program. Um, so that we put that information out there. Uh, I will touch on uh, some of the highlights for our proposed our proposed rule um, policies for QPP. Um, and then we'll turn it over to our subject matter experts that will go into more detail on, on MVPs and then all of our performance categories and scoring, uh, then our, our APM team, and then our Medicare Shared Savings Program team. So uh, I know we have a, a lot of really great information to cover today. I'm sure everybody has read multiple times our rule. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, so, the, but don't worry if you haven't, um, I know not, not everyone does, but we will, we will hit the high points here as it relates specifically to the quality payment program. Um, I do want to flag if, if, um, you were hoping to ask a question, uh, to something that is not related to QPP, this would not be the forum for that, but, um, we can definitely, uh, refer you to some resources, uh, for for other parts of CMS that are included in the physician fee schedule proposed rule. Um, and then also I want to remind folks that um, we'll get to the Q&A at the end and we'll, we'll give you more details on how to participate in that. Um, but we do have our chat function available. So feel free as we're going through. Hopefully we're answering a lot of the questions you may, may be coming into the presentation with. Uh, as we go through the different slides. But if you do have questions, please enter them there. We will do our best to um, answer ones that we can as we're going, but and then get to as many as possible during, during the QA. But as always, we have our QPV Service Center available. If you have a really specific question that you may, um, may need more back and forth discussion on, uh, we do have uh, those wonderful resources available at uh, the Service Center. So encourage you to, we'll, we'll have more information then, but um, encur encourage you to reach out to them as well. Next slide. One more. Okay, great. So um, if you're brand new, what in the world is the quality payment program? So it's a value-based payment program that was established uh, through the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. So we refer to as MACRA. Um, and really the goal um, at that point, there were uh, several different pro reporting programs that clinicians were required to uh, participate in and they were siloed and it was just a lot of different things people um, had to do for CMS. So one of the main goals of MAC was really to advance this forward looking coordinated framework uh, for clinicians to participate in, in one program, the quality payment program. Um, and there are two performance tracks for QPP. So the first is MIPS, 
merit-based incentive payment system. And the second track is the advanced alternative payment models. Um, and we'll get into, I think in the next slide, um, some, some more information on, on where those two overlap. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are two tracks uh, in the quality payment program, so MIPS and advanced APMs. However, um, there are instances where those two, two tracks overlap. So um, this graphic, and then you'll see in the next, the next slide also has a really great graphic that we'll get to. Um, so if you look at all the eligible clinicians to participate in QPP, and then there are a number of criteria that make you MIPS eligible clinician. So out of the MIPS eligible clinicians, you either, if you um, are not participating in an advanced APM, you're required to participate in MIPS if you meet those different eligibility criteria. However, if you participate in an advanced APM, um, if you achieve QP status, so qualifying APM participant status, uh, you are not required to, you're exempt and excluded from participating in MIPS. If you achieve partial QP status, uh, you have the option. You can choose whether you, you want to participate in MIPS or not. And then if you don't achieve QP status or partial QP status, uh, then you'll also be required to participate in MIPS. Next slide, please. So here's the same, same information just shown in a different graphic. So out of all of uh, the participants in advanced um, alternative payment models, there's um, the APM participants. So within those, there's MIPS participants. And then um, if you're a partial QP, you can choose participate in MIPS. And then if you achieve uh, QP status, you are excluded from MIPS and do not need to participate. Next slide. And one more. So some of our key proposals, and um, we'll go into a lot more detail um, as we go through the presentation. But so first off, um, we're really excited to be introducing six new MVPs um, that will be available beginning uh, with the 2025 performance year. Uh, we've proposed uh, some limited modifications to currently finalized MVPs, uh, just making some small small tweaks there. And then we've included, um, we're consolidating two uh, neurological focused MVPs into one MVP. Um, so we're really excited to keep moving forward um, with MVPs. So really look for um, any feedback you all have, have there. Um, we're establishing the APM performance pathway plus quality measure set, so APP plus quality measure set. Uh, we're maintaining uh, the current performance threshold. So for 2024, it's 75 points, and we are proposing to maintain that at 75 points. Um, so hopefully that consistency um, Folks will be uh, happy about that consistency for 2025. Next slide. So we're updating the MIPS measures, um, activities, inventory, and scoring methodologies uh, to give clinicians really the opportunity to um, continue participating successfully in MIPS. So here's just a few things that we are highlighting. Um, we're adding six new episode-based cost measures, and we revised two existing episode-based cost measures. We're using, uh, as we said, average mean um, final scores from 2017 to 2019 and keeping that performance threshold at 75 points. We are revising the methodology for scoring topped out quality measures. We know this has been um, a concern we've heard a lot about. So um, hopefully you'll review more in depth on those, those proposals that we've put out there um, and specialty sets with limited measures. We're changing the MIPS promoting interoperability scoring rules uh, when a clinician has multiple and conflicting submissions um, to hopefully fix um, any issues we've had there, there in the past. We are removing um, improvement activity weighting um, and streamlining the reporting requirements for the performance category. Uh, and lastly, requiring a minimum criteria for, for data submission. So just defining that um, a little more clearly. Next slide. So we have a number of um, requests we're putting out there for information. Um, and as folks that have been part of the quality payment program since, since the beginning or, or just more recently, one of the key aspects of the program is that we really uh, try to take our um, interested parties or people that participate in the program 
your feedback into developing this program so that it makes sense for, for how, how clinicians practice and that we're all working towards the same goal of improving, improving, um, improving patient outcomes and making sure our patients are being taken care of the best um, possible and having the best possible outcomes. So we always look to ask clinicians and, and, and your staff and, and everybody that supports, supports this work um, as we're developing policies, taking your feedback and input into consideration. So we have a number of requests out there. First, um, MVP adoption and subgroup participation. Uh, we've been working on this for a while now and really looking for insights into challenges with completing the transition to MVPs by the 20, by performance year uh, 2029. So number of, number of questions in there. Um, also, public health and clinical data exchange objective under the promoting interoperability performance category, um, asking some questions around that objective. Principles for development of prompts, so patient-reported outcome measures. Uh, changes to the administration of CAPS for MIPS uh, surveys, so some comments uh, there on expanding the, the service modes, a uh, way that we're able to uh, administer the survey. So a lot of a lot of questions out there. So encourage folks to take the time to look through look through all of those questions in more detail and submit them through the the formal rulemaking process. And I believe the next slide might have more information on how to do that. Oh, not quite. Um, so here is uh, you're all set. Thank you. Um, so here's just some some resources we're going to call out. If you haven't um, had a chance to review them, I and you're, you're looking for specific QPP information, um, encourage you to check out uh, our fact sheet that is a policy comparison table that really pulls out the, the key information um, that we're going through today. Um, we also have an MVPs guide, so it gives you more details on uh, the MVPs that are being proposed for 2025 so that um, hopefully it's a helpful tool as you're trying to write your comments um, suggest using that guide um, to give you more information and, and help you be able to um, form your comments. Um, and then also there's a, SS, a Medicare Shared Savings Program uh, proposals fact sheet out there that's specific for um, ACO. So I encourage you to check out all of that information. And um, just wanted to highlight as we're, as we're going through, if you're keeping an eye on the chat, um, our, our team on the line, um, is uh, graciously adding adding links as we're talking, which is super helpful. So um, if you're what if if we have a slide up and you're not sure where I'm talking about where to where to get that information, um, please keep an eye on the chat. And as we said at the beginning, everything you're hearing today uh, will is being recorded, and we always post uh, the recording along with the slides and transcripts of of today's presentation to our uh, QPP webinar library. So that that should be available. In, a uh, couple weeks following following today, so don't don't feel like you have to um, furiously write down information as as we're talking. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Peterman to talk through uh, MVPs. Thanks, Katie. So I will start with reviewing the MVP updates. Next slide, please. So as Katie mentioned, for the 2025 performance year, we proposed six new MVPs. They're here on this slide. Um, they include the complete ophthalmology care, dermatological care, gastroenterology care, optimal care for patients with urologic conditions, pulmonology care, and surgical care. We've also proposed modifications to the, our previously finalized MVPs, including um, that we wanted to highlight a few of those. Um, the consolidation of the optimal care for patients with episodic neurological conditions and the supportive care for neurodegenerative conditions MVPs into a single MVP that's titled quality care for patients with neurological conditions. Um, the reason for that a move is because with the QCR measures that were previously included in both of those MVPs are no longer available for use in MIPS. Therefore, we propose to combine the two to ensure availability of the robust and meaningful MVP that could capture a broad scope of care provided by neurologists. If these proposed updates are finalized, it would bring our total number of MVPs available for reporting in calendar year 2025 to 21. So that wraps up our MVP updates. Next slide, please. I uh, will now be reviewing um, our MIPS proposed rule policies. Next slide, please. 
So this is a um, slide. It gives us a quick overview of the performance category weights. It provides us the various weights, various weights for our four performance categories, quality, cost, improvement activities, and promoting interoperability. So when you look at these points, they from each performance category, they're added together to give you a MIPS final score. Um, this final score is compared to our performance threshold, and it determines whether you receive a positive, negative, or neutral payment adjustment. So this is a good slide to reference back to. Um, I'm now going to pass the presentation over to Lisa Marie. Next slide, please. Lisa Marie, there we go. I can get off oh, mute thank you. Yes. So now I'm going to discuss the quality the proposals relating to the quality payment performance category. Next slide, please. So in regard to the MIPS quality measure inventory, we are proposing an inventory of 196 measures, which includes the addition of nine MIPS quality measures, which also includes two patient reported outcome measures. It also includes substantive changes to 66 existing quality measures. It also includes the removal 11 quality measures from the inventory. I just want to note that this proposal relates to the 2025 performance period. And in regard to QCR measures, the inventory that I just mentioned does not include the QCR measures. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss the data completeness requirement. We're we propose to maintain the data completeness threshold previously established at 75%. The data completeness threshold of 75% would be the requirement for the 2024 to the 2028 performance period. We want to provide sufficient time for MIPS eligible clinicians, groups, virtual groups, subgroups, and APM entities to adjust to the data completeness threshold of 75%. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss modifications to our scoring policies. For the first policy, we're proposing to apply a flat benchmarking methodology to a subset of top-down measures. Specifically, such policy would apply to specialty sets with a limited number of measures and with a high proportion of top-down measures due to areas that have a lack of measure development. The second policy pertains to the proposal to establish flat benchmarks for Medicare CQMs in which ACOs would be scored using flat benchmarks when reporting Medicare CQMs for the 2024 and 2025 performance period. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss the proposal complex organizational adjustment. So the complex organizational adjustment has been proposed in order to account for the organizational complexities that APM entities, including Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs and virtual group experience when reporting ECQMs. For this proposal, we would add one measure achievement point for each submitted CQM that meets data completeness and case minimum requirements. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss revisions to data submission policies. For the data, for, for the quality payment performance category, we are proposing that an organization must include numerator and denominator information for at least one quality measure from the available MIPS quality measures to be considered a data submission and scored. A data submission with only, with only um, data, let's say data or like practice ID will not be suffice and will not be considered a data submission and we would assign a null score. Next slide, please. Also in relation to submission policies, we are proposing to codify the following existing policies pertaining to submission. The first policy regards the submission of data from different organizations, such as a practice administrator and a registry or qualified clinical data registry, also referred to as QCDR. For this case, we would calculate and score each submission and assign the higher of the two scores. The second policy regards the submission of data from the same organization, such as two staff members from the same practice submitting data on behalf of the practice. 
For this case, we assign the score based on the most recent submission in which the latest submission would override any previous submissions of the same submission type for the practice. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn the presentation to Ray. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Ray Desitel, and I'm the cost measure lead for the MIPS program. Next slide, please. So for cost measures, we are proposing to add six new episode-based cost measures, and we are proposing to update two existing episode-based cost measures. The six measures that we are proposing are respiratory infection hospitalization, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, kidney transplant management, prostate cancer, and rheumatoid arthritis. And the two existing measures that we are proposing to update are cataract removal with intraocular lens implantation, currently named routine cataract with IOL implantation. And then the second one is inpatient percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, which is currently named STEMI PCI. And all the measure information forms for all these proposed Measures are available on the CMS website. Next slide, please. And we are also proposing to add criteria to serve as guidance when considering whether to remove a cost measure from the program. So the proposed criteria are um, if it isn't feasible to implement the measure specifications, the measure steward is no longer able to maintain the cost measure, the implementation costs or negative unintended consequences associated with the cost measure outweigh the benefit of its continued use in the program. The measure specifications don't reflect current clinical practice or guidelines. And a more applicable measure is available, including a measure that applies across settings, applies across populations, or is more proximal in time to desired patient outcomes for the particular topic. And that's all we had for cost measures. I'll now pass it to my colleague, Shirley Fung, to go over cost scoring proposals. Thank you, Ray. Good afternoon, everyone. For the cost performance category, we are proposing to revise the cost scoring benchmark methodology. The proposed cost benchmark methodology is based on a national median standard deviation and a performance threshold equivalent point value. This proposed method would take into account the national average by aligning it with the performance threshold equivalent. Specifically, the median cost performance will be set at a point of 7.5. That is the performance threshold equivalent that, that we're talking about here. The cutoffs for the benchmark point ranges would then be calculated based on standard deviations from the national average spending or the median. We believe that the proposed benchmark methodology would more appropriately reward or penalize clinicians with average below or above national average spending. So we're proposing to revise the benchmark methodology starting in calendar year 2024. And I'll walk you through an example. Next slide, please. This example shows you how the proposed standard deviation-based benchmark methodology would better align the assignment of achievement points for cost measures so that clinicians with costs near the median would not receive a disproportionately low score. So let's take a look at Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark's average cost per episode for screening and surveillance colonoscopy cost measure is $1,104. The national average spend for this cost measure is $969.72, let's just say $970. So her average cost per episode is somewhat above the national average spend. When we use the current decile or percentile based benchmark to assign point values, Dr. Clark's 1,104 cost per episode would give her anywhere between two and 2.9 points. And you can see the uh, bolded uh, you know, numbers there. So to be exact, she actually gets 2.3 out of 10 achievement points for this cost measure. But when we use the proposed standard, standard deviation-based benchmark, Dr. Clark's 1,104 cost per episode 
would actually give her anywhere between six and 6.9 points uh, on the table on your right. You can see the bolded um, uh, numbers there as well. To be exact, she gets about 6.02 achievement points. So in Dr. Clark's case, the assignment of the 6.02 achievement points is still somewhere below the performance threshold equivalent of 7.5 because she's, you know, she's spending somewhat above the national average. However, receiving the 6.02 points is better than getting 2.3 achievement points, right? So therefore, we believe that the proposed benchmark methodology would more appropriately reward or penalize clinicians. In fact, based on our analyses utilizing performance year 2022 data, this proposed methodology would increase the mean cost performance category score unweighted from 59 to 71 out of 100, which is an increase of 12 points out of 100 points. So I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Vidya. Thanks, Shirley. My name is Vidya Selipin, and I will be reviewing the MIPS Improvement Activities, or IA, proposals. Next slide, please. So for the calendar year 2025 Improvement Activities Performance category, we are proposing changes to our inventory as follows. We are proposing to add two new activities, modify two activities, and remove eight activities. The two new activities that we are proposing are in the population management subcategory. The first is entitled Implementation of Protocols and Provision of Resources to Increase Lung Cancer Screening Uptake. This would allow MIPS eligible clinicians to receive credit for establishing a process or procedure to increase rates of lung cancer screening. The second that we're um, proposing to add is entitled Save a Million Hearts, Standardization of Approach to Screening and Treatment for Cardiovascular Disease. This would allow MIPS eligible clinicians to receive credit for implementing a standardized evidence-based cardiovascular disease risk assessment and care management plan in their practices. And this particular activity proposal is informed by the results of the CMS Innovation Center Million Hearts model, which includes initial arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease assessment, as well as cardiovascular care management. Next slide, please. In addition, to simplify reporting, we are proposing to two changes to the MIPS Improvement Activities Reporting and Scoring po Policies for um, calendar year 2025 performance period. First, we, plan, we propose to eliminate the weighting of activities. As you know, um, currently we have high weighted and medium weighted activities and we're proposing to remove the weighting altogether. Next, we are proposing to reduce the number of activities for which a clinician um, needs to require to attest to achieve, achieve a score in the improvement activities performance category. So currently MIPS eligible clinicians are required to report either two high weighted activities or four medium weighted, weighted activities or one high weighted and two medium weighted activities. We propose that MIPS eligible clinicians who participate in the traditional MIPS will now be required to report just two activities and MVP participants will now be required to report one activity. We are also proposing that MIPS eligible clinicians who are categorized as either small practice, rural, or in a provider shortage area or non-patient facing will now be required to report just one activity. Next slide, please. Additionally, we are proposing um, what a submission is. So a submission for the improvement activities performance category um, must include a yes response for at least one improvement activity to be considered a data submission and to be scored. So a submission, so if you submit and you only include a date and a practice ID, but you don't submit anything else, that's that would not be considered a submission and you would receive um, a null score in the performance category. Next slide, please. We are also proposing to codify our existing processes pertaining to multiple submissions. 
So for submissions received from different organizations, so um, perhaps from a practice administrator and from a QCDR, we're gonna calculate and score each submission received and then assign the higher of the scores. For submissions that are received from the same organization, so for example, if two staff members from the same practice um, both submit um, to the category, we're gonna score the most recent submission. So the submission, the newer submission would override um, any previous submissions of the same um, submission type from that same organization. Next slide, please. And all of the proposals that I talked about um, can be reviewed in further detail in the proposed rule. And the IA, the uh, Improvement Activities Inventory proposals can be found in Appendix 2 of the proposed rule. I will now pass the presentation on to Elizabeth Holland to review uh, promoting interoperability. Thank you, Vidya. As she mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Holland, and I'm going to walk you through the promoting interoperability performance category. Next slide, please. So we had a pretty light footprint this year for promoting interoperability. We did not propose any changes to our reweighting policies. And that means that um, for 2024, we are reweighting clinical social workers, but we did not propose to continue that into the 2025 performance year. As a reminder, we do have automatic reweighting for, for clinicians who have a uh, particular special status, such as they are practicing in an ambulatory surgical center or ASC, uh, they're hospital based, they're non patient facing, or they're in a small practice, which is 15 or less clinicians. Um, if you do choose to submit data for promoting interoperability, your reweighting will be canceled. Next slide, please. So we are also changing the our data submission policies. So uh, currently, if you submit any data for promoting interoperability, that means if you submitted a performance period time frame, or if you submitted a cert ID, or if you submitted a couple measures, that would cancel your reweighting. And a lot of providers and clinicians found that this was sort of unfair because they didn't mean to submit that data. So now we're proposing that um, we will consider um, how to, we'll only consider complete data submission. So we're actually saying for promoting interoperability, you would submit your attestation statements, all your performance data, um, your EHR certification number, as well as the start and end date for your performance period. Anything less than that, and you, it would not be considered um, a data submission for promoting interoperability, and your reweighting will not be canceled, or any hardship would not be canceled. Uh, next slide, please. So we're also proposing currently, if you have multiple data submissions, we don't know which one to consider. So we pretty much, um, they cancel each other out. And so you get a zero if you have multiple submissions. And we're saying that that was also um, not our best policy. So we're proposing to change it, which means that um, if you do have multiple complete data submissions, we would look at them and choose whichever score would um, give you the highest score. I want to remind everybody that this is a proposed rule. And if you're silent on these things, we have, we sort of assume that you don't like the policies. So if these are policies that you agree with and support, we would welcome your, your comments expressing that support to us. Um, next slide, please. So we're proposing to uh, continue our policy for subgroups that um, you can't submit promoting interoperability as a subgroup, so you would just use your, the group's data for promoting interoperability. Next slide. So now I'm going to foray into some uh, proposed rule policies for final scoring. Next slide, please. So um, we're proposing to allow clinicians to request reweighting if there's some problem with their data submission. So if you believe that you um, 
have an issue with your third party intermediary submission of your data, you could request um, reweighting. What um, you could also consider, we will consider whether you took reasonable efforts to correct the situation. So just forgetting to submit data wouldn't qualify for this proposal. But if you were relying on someone else to submit your data and they did not do that um, on your behalf, uh, then we will take the request and you submit them here, as, as it says through the QBP Service Center, um, with, along with documentation to say that data was not submitted on your behalf. So therefore you're not being account held responsible for others in action on your behalf. So now I'm going to turn it over to Shirley Fung to talk about some more final scoring policies. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, in terms of performance threshold, we are proposing to continue using the 75 points as the performance threshold for calendar year 2025 and payment year 2027. The 75 point performance threshold comes from the mean final score in calendar year 2017 and payment year 2019. So you can see that the 75 point performance threshold has been used in calendar year 2022, 23, 24, and now 25. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Richard. Thank you, Shirley. Um, next slide, please. Uh, before I get to the specific uh, proposal here, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, adding some information that we didn't make a slide up for because I've seen several questions asked about QP thresholds, uh, their levels and when they apply. And uh, I, I guess we didn't do a slide for this because we haven't in the past when they got put in place, but uh, this particular year, we're in the business of retroactively doing something. Normally Congress, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, implemented some freezes the last couple of years. And, and normally that's done towards the end of the calendar year. And in fa and this year, in fact, uh, the legislation didn't pass until, until early this calendar year. So let me quickly explain uh, what key, key, key uh, thresholds are in place, et cetera, and the timing. Um, the, Congress did freeze uh, QP and partial QP thresholds for performance period 2024, that is payment period 2026, and they will continue to be, um, the QP thresholds will continue to be at 50% of uh, payments and 35% of patient levels as they have been the past couple of years. Uh, I was asked about, is that in the rule, et cetera? And yes, we did propose it in this rule. Um, and in effect, we're just retroactively uh, going to put in place what Congress asked us to do. And that that's why the timing is a little bit off. So um, uh, you should assume that those things are frozen. Um, in addition, uh, we're, we're also retroactively putting the 1.88 uh, incentive payment uh, bonus in place uh, retroactively at the beginning of this year, again, for payment year 2024. I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but I just wanted to get that uh, laid out as I know people have a number of questions on that. So uh, regarding the specific uh, proposal we have that's on the slide here, um, our proposal modifies the way QP determinations are made based on participation in advanced APMs. Under current regulations, QP determinations begin by calculating the threshold scores using either the payment amount or patient count methodologies. These threshold scores are percentages based on the ratio of payment amounts to patient counts for attributed beneficiaries to the payment amount or patient counts for attribution eligible beneficiaries, in other words, the denominator, during the QP performance period. And if the threshold scores meet certain levels that I just described, uh, uh, a clinician or, or an entity can achieve QP status in a given year. So specifically what we're proposing this year is to modify the definition of attribution eligible beneficiary, which is the six criteria in our regulations, and to include any beneficiary who has received a covered professional service furnished by an 
uh, eligible clinician for whom we are making QP determinations. Uh, by no longer specifying evaluation and management services as under current regulations to be the default basis, we would eliminate the need to develop customized attribution basis for advanced APMs that do not use e &M services as the basis for attribution. Therefore, our proposal would standardize the attribution methodology for Q QP determinations by making covered professional services the basis for attribution across all advanced APMs. And with that, I'll hand it off to Sabrina Ahmed. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'll be reviewing the shared savings program quality proposals that were included um, in this proposed rule. Next slide, please. So to promote alignment with CMS's quality program and adoption of the Universal Foundation measure set, we're proposing to create the APP plus quality measure set that aligns with the Adult Universal Foundation quality measures for performance year 2025 and subsequent performance years, we're proposing to require shared savings programs to report the APP plus quality measure set. The existing APP quality measure set would no longer be available for reporting by shared savings program ACOs. The APP plus um, quality measure set would also be an optional measure set available for MIPS eligible clinicians groups and APM entities that participate in a MIPS APM and are not shared savings program ACOs. Next slide, please. The APP plus um, quality measure set would incrementally grow to comprise of 11 measures consisting of the six measures in the existing APP quality measure set and five newly proposed measures from the Adult Universal Foundation measure set that would be incorporated into the APP plus quality measure set over performance years 2025 through 2028. Uh, we're proposing to add two measures in performance year 2025, one measure in performance year 2026, and, um, and another two measures in performance year 2028. Um, these measures are listed in the next slide, which is slide 47. So in total, there would be eight measures in the APP plus quality measure set for shared savings program ACOs in performance year 2025, um, nine measures in performance years 2026 and 2027, and 11 measures in performance years 2028 and subsequent performance years. Uh, ACOs would be required to report on all measures in the measure set annually. Uh, we are also proposing to streamline the collection types available for shared savings program ACOs, reporting the APP plus measure set to focus on the eCQM and Medicare CQM collection types beginning in performance year 2025. The MIPS CQM collection type uh, would not be available for shared savings program ACOs reporting the APP plus quality measure set beginning in performance year 2025. Next slide, please. Uh, the table um, in slide 47 lists the proposed quality measures that will be added to the APP plus quality measure set incrementally over performance years 2025 through 2028. For additional policies related to the shared savings program, please refer to the shared savings program proposals fact sheet um, that's shown in slide 12. Uh, next, I would like to hand the presentation over to Katie Moore. Thank you. Great, thanks Sabrina. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, we are almost done, folks. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, so just some important reminders on this slide. As we've said, uh, there is a formal comment process that we must 
um, adhere to. So the most important thing on this slide is the date, September 9th at 5 p.m. is a very strict hard date. Um, it's our 60 day comment period, it's when it ends. So by that time, we have to have received either electronically through regulations.gov, uh, through regular mail, express mail, um, your formal comments. So um, please take a look at this information um, and submit and all of the, the rule and proposals that we've put out there and um, just plan on, on getting your information in time. Uh, we always love to get comments in earlier, um, but no uh, folks have a lot on their plates. So please keep in mind that September 9th, 5 p.m. deadline. Next slide. And again, just where you can find some of those resources we talked about and have been flagged throughout the presentation, QPP resource library on qpp.cms.gov. Um, you'll find our, our modified MVPs guide, um, as well as our QPP uh, fact sheet and comparison table. Um, and then as we mentioned previously, if we aren't able to get to uh, your question today, it looks like we'll have um, uh, some time here to answer questions, but if we don't get to yours or, or you need more of a discussion, please reach out to the QPP Service Center by either opening a ticket um, from our website or um, calling the number you see on the screen. Um, and again, if you uh, if you participate in the Shared Savings Program, please contact your ACO coordinator as your, your first line of line of questions there. Um, and uh, with that, I will turn it uh, back over to Hallie to walk us through how the Q&A will go. Thanks, Katie. So we're now gonna start the Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder, you can ask questions using the Q&A box or you can raise your hand to ask a question via the webinar audio and we will unmute your line. As a reminder, participants are invited to share initial comments or questions, but only comments formally submitted through the process outlined by the Federal Register are taken into consideration by CMS. So to start off our Q&A portion, we do have a couple of questions from the Q&A box. Um, the first question reads, are MSSPs required to report NIPS PI beginning in performance year 2025 and subsequent years? Hi, this is Sabrina Ahmed. Um, yes, the requirement for shared savings program ACOs to report the MIPS PI uh, performance category will still um, be applicable beginning in performance year 2025. Thanks, Sabrina. The next question is, is the QP status threshold and 1.88% bonus going to apply to 2025 as well? Hi, this is Richard. Uh, at this time, the 1.88 bonus only applies to 2024. Uh, current statute uh, reads that beginning in 2025, for the performance period 2025 and payment year 2027, there will be no uh, bonus payment. Thank you, Richard. The next question we have in the Q&A box is, Will the APP plus quality measures be included as ECQMs in traditional MIPS as well? Amy, can you repeat the question? Sure. Will the APP plus quality measures be included as ECQMs in traditional MIPS as well? So currently there are, so, so depending on like which year performance period we're talking about, um, there are some um, ECQMs that are available in traditional MIPS. Um, as you saw in the proposed rule, there are um, other measures that are, but, but essentially the, the measures that are available um, in MIPS and let's see if they're not available um, Sorry, let me start over. If let's say there's um, an ECQM that's available under the APP and it's not necessarily available currently under um, under traditional MIPS, um, if we haven't outlined 
um, any proposals for a new measure or if we haven't identified a new collection type for a measure, we're not able to specify if a new collection type is being developed. So if we haven't specified in a rule that, as I said, a new collection type is being developed, um, then we're not able to say one for purposes of of the measure, let's say not being in development as a new collection type, or we're in the midst of proposing potentially a new collection type. So maybe something hasn't been finalized. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa Murray. The next question we have in the Q&A box is, to confirm the new measures for APM reporting, we can submit them via ECQM, but MIPCQM will not be ready for these measures until after 2025? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So it's asking for clarification if you can please confirm the new measure for APM reporting. We can submit them via ECQM, but MIPCQM will not be ready for these measures until after 2025. So um, the measures included in the APP plus measure set will be, um, will be added well, the, the five new universal foundation measures will be added to the APP plus measure set according to the um, timeline shown in um, slide 47. So at the point that the measures are added to the APP plus measure set, they will be available for reporting um, as both the eCQM and Medicare CQM collection type. However, the MIPCQM collection type uh, will not be available for um, shared savings program ACOs beginning in performance year 2025. Thank you, Sabrina. The next question we have in the queue reads, does APP plus replace the current APP measure set in performance year 2025? So the APP plus quality measure set um, will be required for shared savings program ACOs reporting quality beginning in performance year 2025. The existing APP measure set will no longer be available for uh, shared savings program ACOs. However, the existing APP measure set would still continue to be available for MIPS eligible clinicians, groups, and APM and other APM entities um, that participate in a MIPS APM. Thank you, Sabrina. And it looks like we have some questions on the line. The first question is from Dina. Dina, we have unmuted your line if you'd like to unmute yourself. All right, you are still muted, so we will move on to the next question. Our next question on the line is from Lori. Lori, we have unmuted your line if you would like to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could go back to, I think it was slide eight at the beginning. Um, it was about QP status. If I could see that slide, there was something a little bit confusing about it. It may be slide seven, I think. Maybe. <laughs> it was like, are you not eligible? No, one, uh, no, <laughs> couple more back. Couple more back. One more back. Um, yep, this one. one. So it reads, don't have QP or partial QP status. Yes. So... <laughs> It's a, so you're not a QP or a partial QP. It says you're re required to submit uh, mm -hmm. MIPS. Then partial, you can select. But then it reads QP status MIPS, no. 
and then clinicians with QP status are excluded. Should that be QP status MIPS? Oh, does that mean MIPS? You don't report MIPS? You, report you got it. Through another way? Okay. It's just, a, it's a, so this, this is separate. It's saying, do you sub sub report in traditional MIPS? Okay. I was reading this right. slide. It makes sense to me now. I got it. <laughs> okay, good. No worries. It's, Thank it's you. I want to talk it out because other people may have been confused too. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> I got it now. All right, thank you both. Um, our next question on the line comes from Christine. Christine, we have unmuted your line if you would like to unmute yourself. Hi, um, so this is more, not really a question. Well, maybe it is. Um, and I was putting it also in the chat, but um, for, for, for many of the, um, the way that, much of the way that this is organized is focused on um, you know, smaller practices. We have uh, one of our tins is um, more than 2000 providers and it's mix of inpatient, um, inpatient providers. So ED, critical care docs, um, hospitalists, and, and also um, the tin is mixed with the physician practices with um, more than 400 locations, right? So we're struggling with in, in improvement activities that cover the 50% that meet the 50 percentile threshold for both both entities, both facility types. Have you guys talked that through? Are you, is it on your radar as something that we're struggling with um, outside of doing a subgroup? I don't know if there's any plans to look at the ability to parse out improvement activities into facility type. It's just something we're really struggling with. This is Vidya Salopin. I'll just, um, around the question about the improvement activities um, um, performance category, I would just suggest that if you have um, you know, a suggestion like that, that you um, comment in the rule. Um, that way we can fully address it. Uh, is there a place where I can comment? Is it just on the QPP website? I think, Katie, do you have the information or can we share the information about where people can go to submit their comments officially? Because yeah, they're... is it the previous slide, um, Kelly? If we can process move back. By the federal register. Yeah, so just where we had talked about um, Christine in the submitting formal comments through the through the rule. Oh, one more back. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, so if you go to regulations.gov, uh, that's the electronically part. Um, and then submit your comment there. That'd be great. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, and you can just comment, you know, if you want to specifically, I mean, definitely use the file code. Um, but then, yeah, specifically call out the improvement activity section and put that in there. That'd be great. Okay, we will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and we will get that link to you as well. Um, the next question we have in the queue is, will there still be bonuses and penalties for 2025 QPP and have these changed? Again, the question is, will there still be bonuses and penalties for 2025 QPP? Have these changed? Uh, this is Richard. Uh, I can speak to bonuses. I'm not sure what they mean by penalties. Um, if you're referring to QP um, incentive payment bonuses, which we were talking about earlier, there are no um, incentive payment bonuses uh, beginning with payment 
performance period 2025, payment period 2027. However, um, beginning this year and continuing next year, there is a financial reward in terms of the uh, conversion, new conversion factor kicks in uh, where there's an adjustment of 0.75 for being a QP and uh, just 0.25 for non-QPs. And that will be in place next year as well. Um, again, I'm not sure what penalty, what you mean by penalties. So. All right, thank you, Thanks, Richard. Richard. I'll, um, sorry, I was talking myself on mute. Um, I'll add to that too. I think bonuses, I was, Richard, I was, my, my head went to APM soup, but if, if the question was broader about just positive and negative payment adjustments uh, for 2025, yes, is the answer. There, there will be positive and negative payment adjustments, but um, we won't know that until we, you don't know that in advance until, until, um, until after data submission because the program is budget neutral. So um, we won't know how much of a, a positive payment adjustments or what the distribution will be um, until after data submission, which for performance year 2025 will take place uh, January through March timeframe of 2026. Thanks. Um, and real quick, um, as we were talking about um, electronic submission uh, for for rule, for our rule comments, I just wanted to flag that that option will not be available and officially uh, the rule is published on July 31st. So um, sorry for not clarifying that, but just, just wanted to flag in case people are looking right now and are wondering why they don't see it. Um, the rule is on display right now, but will be officially published in the Federal Register, Register beginning uh, July 31st. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Our next question is, is TI reporting required for Medicare Share Savings Program and other advanced APMs that achieved QP status beginning in 2025? This is Sabrina. Um, so for performance years beginning on or after January 1, 2025, um, unless otherwise excluded, an ACO participant, ACO provider, supplier, and ACO professional that is a MIPS eligible clinician, um, QP or partial QP, um, regardless of track, must report the MIPS uh, promoting interoperability performance category measures. So thank you. Is, yes, thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. The next question we have is, is there any further detail of when or if when traditional MIPS reporting will be sunsetting? So we haven't officially um, proposed a uh, sunset date for traditional MIPS. However, as uh, we mentioned earlier in the presentation, we do include some questions around um, in our uh, RFI, our request for information, about potentially um, sunsetting traditional MIPS in 2029. So looking forward to, to feedback on that, but we have not made any official proposal that that would or would not happen. We're just um, gathering more information on that. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Our next question is how long do we have to active with TEFCA to count in PI for 2025? You have to have TEFCA, uh, you have to be participating in TEFCA for the entire performance period and for the promoting interoperability performance category, that's 180 days. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so that concludes all of our questions in the queue. We wanted to do one final call for questions. If anyone had any on the line that they wanted to raise their hand and we can unmute your line to answer your question out loud. And while we are waiting for, um, just to see if anyone wants to raise their hand, just a reminder that 
all of these materials will be posted to the QPP webinar library in the coming weeks. Um, it looks like we have a question on the line from Rachel. Just as a reminder also, before I unmute you, um, we are only answering questions today about the proposed rule. So if your question is not about the proposed rule, we ask that you hold your question for another time. So Rachel, we have unmuted your line. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I asked this through the q and I don't know, I apologize. I don't think you responded, but if you did, I apologize. Um, my question has to do with the proposal to remove the topped out scoring cap for select measures. Um, and I was just hoping to get some clarification about the proposal. Um, the proposal hinges on CMS doing an assessment of specialty measure sets sort of on a case by case basis to see um, if they should remove the topped out uh, scoring cap. Um, my question is if, if CMS determines within a specific set that there's a specific measure that's at risk and it shouldn't be subject to the cap, does that mean that that measure in general and all of MIPS would not be subject to the cap, even if it's you know in other specialty sets where it might not, that specialty set might not be considered at risk? I'm just um, trying to understand sort of how the removal of the cap would apply to the measure. This is Rachel. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, call, Colleen, go ahead. Okay, uh, this is Colleen from the PIMS team. Um, for those measures, if, if a measure is determined to fall under this policy and does have that seven point cap removed and is subject to that flat benchmark scoring, it would be the same across all the specialty measure sets within MIPS, um, as well as if that measure were used in an MVP. So it, it, would, it would be at the measure collection type level. Great, thank you. Yep. All right, thank you everyone. That is going to conclude our Q&A portion for today. Um, just as a reminder, if we did not answer your question, you are more than welcome to contact the service center with um, an inquiry, but I will now turn it back to Katie Moore to close us out. Katie? Great. Thanks, Holly. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, reading through your comments as you submit them re uh, related to the proposed rule. So uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and we will talk to you all soon. Thanks.